Okay, so today I'm going to teach you guys how to test a spinal nerve root. So a spinal nerve root, remember, has a specific derma, which means skin, dermatome, and that is the area that you would either test or where the patient would feel the pain or the numbness. Um, they have a myo, which means muscle, myotome, which is the muscle that gets most of its primary innervation from that particular nerve root. And then some of them have a reflex associated as well. Now, when I'm getting ready to test the patient, I'm gonna explain, I'm gonna start with cotton wool, which tests the dorsal column medial meniscus system. And I'm gonna ask the patient to pull your shirt sleeves up for me and to pull your shorts up for me so that I can see L3, L4 and C5 nice and clear. Now, I'm going to get the patient into anatomical position, palms up. I can test the posterior aspects, absolutely, but it's just easier for me to start from anatomical position. And I would explain to the patient that I'm going to be touching you in various points of your arms and legs, and I'm going to get you to close your eyes, and I want you to say yes every time I touch you there, okay? Now, when I'm going through, I need to make sure the cotton ball is no bigger than the end of my finger, and when I touch, it will literally be a touch. It is not a stroke. Because what I'm trying to do is keep the stimulus to a minimum, because most of the time I'm not looking for true numbness, I'm looking for a reduction in sensitivity. And if I put too much stimulus into it, I'll never be able to pick that up. So first what I'm gonna do is just demonstrate to you where the dermatomes are. So we know that C5 is the lateral upper arm, C6 is the lateral forearm, including the thumb and the second finger, C7 is basically the third finger coming into the palm, and C8 is the fourth and fifth finger coming up to the palm, and T1 is coming up through the medial forearm, okay, the inner arm. And when I'm testing a dermatome, what I'm going to do is I'm going to test multiple points in any one place, and I'm going to compare left and right. So if I was testing, for instance, my C6 dermatome, I would be testing a few points coming down into the hand, and then I would mirror that on the other side to see whether or not there was a difference between left and right, as well as amongst the dermatomes themselves. So when you're testing C5, multiple points, C6, going down the entirety of the dermatome, C7, C8, going through the palm, and T1. Now what you want to do is to make sure you avoid borders where is this right here? Is this C5? Is it T1? We don't know because it's different for everyone. So when I test C5, I'm going to stay away from the elbow. When I test C6, I'm going to stay away from the elbow. I want to test where I'm sure that this should be. Now if I was testing the legs, I'm going to just, you just move your hands for me, but it's going to be the same principle. I'm going to test you on various points of your legs. We know the dermatomes. L2 is the upper thigh, it wraps around like a candy cane. L3 is the distal thigh, it wraps around like a candy cane. L4 is the medial lower leg going all the way to the side of the big toe. L5 is the top of the foot and the lateral calf. And S1 would start here, right below the belly of the calf muscles. It goes down the back of the leg and under the hole of the sole of the foot. So again, when I'm testing, it's the same technique if I was testing L2, I would test a few points in the dermatome and I would be comparing left to right as I went through. So I'm not testing just the leg, but I'm also comparing left and right, okay? One thing with L2, make sure that you avoid the nether region. Don't go up too close to the groin. Just keep it kind of onto the anterior thigh. What I'm looking for when I'm testing sensory stuff, so I should have full recognition. They should be nearly 100% accurate in terms of the touch. Um, they might have a, a slightly reduced accuracy where they're not picking up every single touch, or they might have paresthesia where they um, might have uh, burning or prickling sensations or like a nettle-like sensation, pins and needles. I could have allodynia, which is pain on a non-painful stimulus, and I could have hyperalgesia, which is an increased pain response to when I'm testing the pinprick. Now, when I'm testing the pinprick, in clinic you use um, a little medipin, but here I'm just going to use the end of my reflex hammer because it's got a little sharp point, so it's made to do this. Um, the point of this one is I'm testing the lateral spinal thalamic tract just to register a different type of touch. It's a totally different nerve pathway. But the principle would be the same. You would still be testing multiple points in the dermatome comparing left and right, and the technique would be eyes closed, and it's just a touch. 
Okay, I'm not jabbing it into him. I want it to be light, and he should be able to detect that as a stimuli. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the myotonal strength. So when I'm looking at testing a myotone, I need to support and isolate, because I don't want to test how strong he is as a person. I want to test the strength of that individual muscle. So for instance, if I was testing the bicep, which is this muscle here, and what it does is it flexes the arm, I'm going to bring my hand underneath the back of his elbow, and I'm going to just put your dukes up for me, just hold support your hand. I'm going to come below the wrist because I don't want to test two joints. I just want to test this muscle. So I'm going to bring my forearm here and I'm going to say, okay, I want you to resist me. And I'm going to give it a little welly so that he actually has to work. Because if I just do a little impulse, I'm never going to pick up a slightly reduced strength. So I need to make him work for it, but relative to his strength as a person. So if I was testing granny versus Tim, I would be expecting a different normal level for that person. So I would do that on the right and then put up your dukes to the left. I would repeat the process holding for a count of five. Okay? So C5 is your bicep. C6 is brachioradialis coming into wrist extension. Now, you've got the lever principle, which is important. If I keep his wrist in normal, in neutral, relax for me. If I keep his wrist here and I say, okay, resist my pressure. It's really hard for him to resist that because this is a long lever. If I get him to extend his wrist up for me, I bring my hand under the wrist into the back and I say resist. This is easier for him. So again, I get a better indicator if there's a true, a true weakness here. So you're gonna get him to tip their wrists up and you're gonna resist, okay? So that's C6 brachioradialis, repeat on the other side, okay? If I was then coming into C7, C7 is going to be the tricep, and your tricep muscle extends the elbow, okay? It extends the elbow. So if I was testing that one, it's basically the same way that you would test the bicep. You're just spinning your hand around to the front of the arm instead. So again, I don't want to work through the wrist, but I want to come down and I'm going to support at the elbow. But it's the same principle. So I would get him to put up your dukes for me, come behind the elbow, underneath the wrist, Try to straighten your arm against me, push away. Okay, and I would hold it for five and then repeat. And you can do this out of order. So when I'm testing, I would do C5 bicep, C7 tricep, and then I would go to, to brachioradialis. But it's totally up to you the order that you do. C8 is going to be flexor digitorum profundus. So that means flexor is to bring the fingers inwards, digitorum means the fingers, profundus means it's a deep muscle. So if I Keep the finger straight, and I say, okay, just resist me. This is going to be pulling a lot of finger in, into the, the flexors of the forearm. This is actually one of the tests that you guys are going to learn for uh, a medial abacondylitis, okay? So to get into the deep muscles of the hand, what I need to do is I don't want to come onto the MCPs, but I come up to this first big knuckle, and I'm going to pin it with my fingers. I'm going to say, curl around me a little bit, and then I'm going to get him to resist for a count of five, and that will bring that a lot deeper into the palm, okay? And then I would compare on the other side. T1 is resist, uh, resisted AB, so abduction of the fifth digit, so I get him to spread his fingers. It doesn't matter if the hand is palm up or palm down, you can do it either way. But what you're going to do is you're going to support, so I'm just basically bracing his hand so it doesn't move out. I get him to bring his fingers out wide, don't let me push it in, okay, and I'm just going to press against it. And it wouldn't matter which position I had in hand. Now, if I was going to test the legs now, we know that L2 is a hip flexor. So what I could say is, okay, Tim, I want you to just raise your foot right off the ground. But do you notice that as he does that, he leans back and he translates off to the side. So that then shows I'm not solely testing the hip flexor, I'm bringing core into it. So if he had a lot of pain and moving him on the bench was hard, then I could test the hip flexors this way, absolutely. But it's not the best test because it's not super specific in terms of him. So what I'm actually going to do is to lay down onto his back. So when I come in and test the hip flexors, what I want to do is I'm going to get him to come into the short lever position, so I'm going to get him into a 90 degree bend of hip flexion. I'm going to wrap my hands around the distal femur, and I'm going to say to him, okay, Tim, I want you to bring your knee to your nose, okay, cool, and I'm going to put some welly into it so he's really having to work to resist me. Now, I don't want to do so much that I pull him down the bench. But he should have to work for this, okay? If I just do this, he's not using a lot of muscles to stop me. And this is a big muscle, so I really needed to, to put a little effort into that one. So L2 is your hip flexor. L3 
is your quads here in the front, and what they do is knee extension. So again, I want to keep a short lever, so I'm going to hook under the knee and put my hand over the top of the leg. And I'm going to make it clear to the patient, what I want you to do is straighten your leg to the ceiling, don't push it out towards me at the front. Okay, go ahead and straighten. And I'm going to push up and I'm going to resist and hold in there. Go ahead and relax. And I'm going to do that for, again, a count of five, comparing the left and the right song. So that is going to be L3, the quads. Now, if I was looking at testing L4, L4 is going to be ankle dorsiflexion, and that utilizes the tibialis anterior muscle here, right next to the tibia. Okay, it pulls the foot back. Now, I can do this passively in a, either a laying down or a sitting up uh, purposes. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to get him to sit up because I think it'll be easier for you guys to see what I'm doing. So for L4, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get him to rock up onto his heel for me. Nope, onto your heel. There you go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just support him at the back so he's not going to slide. And I'm going to say, don't let me push your foot down. And notice I'm not on his toes. I'm coming to the main aspect of the foot and I'm going to push and I'm going to put in a fair amount of pressure because this is a very strong muscle. Okay. And I would compare the other side. So that's going to be L4 tibialis anterior. For L5, that is your hallux extension. Just bring your foot flat for me. Hallux extension, that means it raises big toe. So I'd ask him to raise his big toe. Some people can do big toe individually. Some people can't. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to get him to lift it. I'm not coming under the toenail. I'm going to come right below it and again apply pressure to get him to resist and compare across. S1 is plantar flexion. Plantar flexion is where you point the toes down like you're going on tiptoe and it's activated by these muscles in the calf and they're called the gastrocnemius and the soleus. So if I was going to test this, what I would do is I would again come and support. So I'm going to keep him from kicking out. So I'm going to put my hand here and I'm going to try to pull him up. Okay, and again, these are really strong muscles, so I would be comparing the left and the right side. Now, the tibialis anterior and the gastrocnemius soleus, so that ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, are really important for functional gait. So I can test these muscles here with the person sitting still, but what I also want to test for these muscles is I want to test their functional strength in terms of being able to walk. So I can do that to see whether he can lift his body weight by literally getting him to stand on, on with his heels up, just in that stance, holding it. Or I can get him to stand on tiptoe, holding his weight. And I would do that if somebody didn't have very good balance. I'd get him to put their hand against the wall. But if he's got good balance, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you to stand up for me, Tim. And I want you to face that way. Come up on tiptoe. And I'm going to be down behind him and low. Go ahead and walk forward for me. And I need to be down and low because I'm looking for a heel drop. Okay, and I'm not going to see that if I'm off to the side. To test L4 tib ant, what I'm going to get him to do is come up onto your heels with your toes up, and I'm going to be down and low because I'm looking for a foot drop in the front. Great, go ahead and sit down for me. I'm looking for that. Um, when you're looking at muscles, so what I could be looking for is a flaccid or floppy weakness, and that would be related to a lower motor neuron, um, and what I might see with that is atrophy or twitching into the muscles. I might have a spastic weakness, which is related to an upper motor neuron. And when I'm grading this on a scale, you're basically grading five, thing, five out of five is full strength, four out of five is it's reduced strength, but there is some resistance, three out of five is they can resist gravity, but at night you, two out of five is that you're getting some contraction in the muscle, and one out of five would be you're getting a twitch, but nothing else. Zero is gonna be no action, okay? And that would be paralysis. So you're grading it on that scale. Now, after I do that, I'm going to come in and I'm going to test the reflexes. So when I'm testing the reflexes of the arm, what I'm going to do is first say, okay, I'm going to test the reflexes. I'm just going to brace your arm on mine. So for C5, which is your bicep, I've got him with his arm laying across my forearm so that it's coming out behind my elbow. His bicep is here, so I'm going to get him to contract it. Here's the crease of the elbow. If I come just above it, I should feel that tendon. I'm just going to adjust him so he's nice and comfortable on my arm. I then get him to relax for me. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give that a strike. And I'm looking for contraction in this muscle. I'm not looking for his arm to jump off of my arm. I'm looking for contraction in that muscle. Now, the arm muscles are not necessarily all that strong in most people, these reflexes. So if I, want to, if I think the reflex is low and I want to see if I can bring it on, what I can do is get him to grate his teeth. Grate your teeth nice and hard. 
and you can see how that increases the reflex a little bit. It gives a bit more jump, okay? But ultimately what I'm looking for is comparison of this reflex to that reflex, okay? And globally through the arms, and then globally arms versus legs, and I'm looking for some sort of unusual asymmetrical response, which means that everything is normal except this one reflex is different, okay? If everybody's globally low, that's probably just them. Hypermobile people are gonna be low, some people they just rev a little low, some people are a little higher. As long as it's basically the same throughout the body, it's not usually too much of a problem. So C5 is bicep. The brachioradialis, make a fist for me please. Brachioradialis runs like this. So here is the wrist. I'm gonna come about midway up, and if I get him to relax, and I squeeze a little bit, you can see I'm getting a little action down there into the hand. Okay, so he stays totally relaxed, and I give it a strike. Again, I'm looking for activation in the muscle here. I'm not looking for movement of the hand particularly. If I was looking at C7, C7 is a tricep, and the easiest way is to hook them underneath, but you want them to keep their, elbow, their shoulder nice and relaxed. Sometimes people will hitch, and that then causes the muscles to get tight, so you want the shoulder to be relaxed. What I can get him to do is straighten his arm, Straighten his arm. Straighten your arm. Thank you. Here's the old cranium process. Here's the tendon. Go ahead and relax. And I can give that a little strike. Okay? And I'm looking for that to come out. I'm looking for a contraction. Okay. Now I'm going to come up and I'm going to do the reflexes in the legs. <laughs> so the first one that I've got is my patellar reflex. So here's my patella. Okay? The, the bone in the knee. And I want to come down below that to where you can feel a little bit of give, okay? Now normally I would raise the bench up until my leg is dangling, but if you can't do that, you can just get them to cross one leg over the other, okay? And if I kick that, do you see how that engenders a response in me, okay? That's going to be your L4 reflex, the patellar reflex. Now your S1 reflex, your Achilles reflex, what you're going to do is you're going to come down to the, the bone here, the calcaneus. And right above it, that's your Achilles tendon, okay? So if I have somebody sitting on the bench, and I have their feet dangling down, what I'm going to do is I'm going to see that they're naturally sitting in a little bit of plantar flexion, because this is nice and relaxed. So I need to put a little tension into this um, to create enough uh, to get some action here. So again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the bone, come up, and I can see by squeezing into the tendon, I'm in the right place, because his foot drops down a little bit. I'm gonna just come under the ball of the foot, so right under the toes, and all I do, I'm not really extending his foot, I'm just getting a little bit out of plantar flexion, just a little bit level. I come around with my other hand, I find the bone and then come above it so I know where it is that I wanna strike. And you can see that that's causing his foot to drop down into my hand with every strike. When you're testing somebody, coming back to the patellar, don't stand in front of them. Because if they have a hyperreflexive response, they will kick you in the nether regions. When you're holding, I was holding it before like this when I was doing it on me, but when I'm in this position, I don't really like it. So for me, I come underneath and I actually hold the hammer like this. Now go ahead and relax your leg, okay? And I give that a whack and you can see that I'm getting a response um, coming in from the tendon, okay? Now in the, in the legs, if you're not getting much of a response, what you can do is get them to interlock their fingers and pull and you can see that that increases the response there um, in the tendon. When we're grading responses into a tendon, you can come off for me. You've got, what Tim was showing was a normal two plus. If a person was hyperreflexive, what you would typically see is when you strike, they're gonna kick out and it will lift their leg a little bit off, okay? You're gonna see the thigh come up a little bit. That would be a three plus. If I'm a four plus, what I would do is I would have a big kick and then I would continue to kick. And that's called clonus, okay? And that would be a four plus. If I am hypo-reflexive, that would be a one. You're just going to see a little response, okay? A reduced response to what you would expect. And zero would be obviously no response at all. Um, so again, if I am hyper-increased reflex, so a three or a four, that's going to relate to an upper motor neuron. If I'm hypo-reflexive, so that's going to be a, a 1 or a 0, that would relate to a lower motor neuron type of damage. Okay? Okay.